This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. So I'm going to hit you with an honest truth here. I think shark movies are overrated. Every summer, I get dozens of comments wanting me to cover the scariest shark movies ever made, but frankly, I've yet to experience one that's truly gotten under my skin like other man versus nature films. It's not that I don't find sharks scary, I mean, everything scares me. It's just not a creature I identify with my own fears in the same way I do wolves, bears, spiders, and TikTokers. They just kinda bore me, and I think it's also because I've been exhaustedly reminded throughout my life by the fun police that sharks are probably the most aggressively misrepresented animal in fiction, as they are generally passive towards humans because we're not in their preferred diet. But then again, pretty much every animal is exaggerated and misrepresented in the media for the sake of dramatic effect. It's called suspension of disbelief. It only really becomes a problem when sensitive accounts are taken out of context, but at this point, maybe we gotta stop expecting fiction to be our basis for facts, just saying. Anyway, the reason I've never covered the masterpiece that is Steven Spielberg's Jaws is because it is the most ubiquitously talked about shark movie out there, and I don't think anyone needs another reminder from this pretentious prick as to why it will likely forever remain the unbeaten king of the shark horror subgenre. Not only does it have perfectly crafted suspense, intriguing conflicts and characters, many genuinely harrowing moments, and is just an all-round exciting summer blockbuster, but it played right into the theme of domestic terror prominent in the 70s by building around the premise of a realistic freak anomaly where nobody ever expects to be the victim of random violence or tragedy. Now, I did consider covering Open Water because I think it's probably the most unique shark movie out there, well, depending on your definition of unique. However, Open Water is a literal endurance test, and I just don't have the attention span to sit through its depressive, overwhelming bleakness again, so if that's off the table and you know my type of content by now, let me welcome you to the opposite end of the spectrum, Deep Blue Sea. As a kid, I was obsessed with the trailer for Deep Blue Sea. It was marketed as a legitimately serious shark shocker that captured the disquieting intimacy and isolation of the typical horror setting, with a flooding dilapidated military bunker renovated into an underground research lab. Years later, I was surprised how many critics seemed to treat Deep Blue Sea as some kind of daft B-movie. That's just what 90s horror cinema indirectly became because of their efforts to mimic 80s conventions. This is a lesson about the drinking. Let's just say I've learned it. Movies like Deep Rising certainly earned that reputation, but Deep Blue Sea is definitely not a B-movie, and was very much intended to be a suspense-heavy action horror akin to the Alien series. After all, its director Rennie Harlan had and still has a very diverse background of films with varying degrees of quality, including Elm Street 4, Exorcist The Beginning, Die Hard 2, Cliffhanger and Cutthroat Island, which almost ruined his career. In fact, in a 1999 interview, Harlan had a ridiculously ambitious goal to make Deep Blue Sea walk the same line as other big budget horrors like The Exorcist, The Shining and Jaws by rejecting what he felt was horror becoming the bastard child in Hollywood, especially with their growing emphasis on tongue-in-cheek self-awareness. It's a very telling interview of Harlan's noble but overreaching desire for Deep Blue Sea to be a sincere send-off to the 90s and transition the horror genre into the 21st century. It's not that the movie is bad or anything, it's just that Harlan really overhyped Deep Blue Sea when I think most people were happy enough to settle with a fun shark movie that wasn't shite. By the way, while we're on it, just look at what Deep Blue Sea was releasing against, like holy shit there was a lot of competition. It's interesting how 5 year old me distinctly remembers American Pie and Inspector Gadget but not the Blair Witch Project. Anyway, despite 1999's stiff competition, Deep Blue Sea did do very well at the box office, and while it obtained a lukewarm reception, I think it's fair to say that most audiences generally have fond memories of it. 
Yet, what is surprising is that it did not actually get a sequel until 2018 when Warner Brothers decided to dust off the old property for a direct-to-video release, along with a third film dropping just last summer. I haven't seen them, but I know some of you likely have, so please tell me about them in the comments below because I'll only be convinced if they're either overlooked gems or just so impressively shite that I just have to watch them. So, moving on to the story, Deep Blue Sea follows a team of scientists developing what is effectively a cure for Alzheimer's, as they've discovered a way to reactivate dead brain cells by experimenting on genetically mutated sharks who have grown so fiercely intelligent that they find a way to break into the facility and hunt down the humans. Just from that description, you can see what I mean by calling Harlan's ambitions overreaching to have Deep Blue Sea be a return to the big budget horrors of Jaws, The Shining, and The Fucking Exorcist. It's your typical far-fetched Hollywood science fiction, but it's certainly intriguing when you start to break down the human conflict, because aside from the thrills and chills, Harlan's influence and changes to the script do a great job at making the film <clears throat> subvert certain expectations. Quick warning, I'm going to spoil the ending and everything else from here on out because it will make a lot more sense when you see how a specific crucial change helps recontextualize a huge conflict within the story. But just before we dive into that, I think now is a good time to remind you about the real, well, other real sharks of the world, and that's those lurking behind their computers ready to prey upon all the vulnerable fish in the sea. That's why this video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Consider this your safety net looking to catch these wicked sharks like your internet service provider or criminal scum before they eat away at your personal and private data and harvest it for profit and exploitation. Now that there's a bit more life in the world, it's nice to get out in a bite, and for the last few weeks I've been writing my videos in cafes and uh, the occasional pub, don't judge, it's been a long year. However, connecting to public Wi-Fi to use my cloud drive is like blood to a shark because you have no idea what sinister individuals might be using it and it's unlikely to grant you much protection. Without ExpressVPN, it's basically like using a public bathroom with the cubicle door wide open or speaking to your bank on a loudspeaker and allowing everyone to listen. ExpressVPN relieves my fears by channeling all my data through a secure encrypted server so I can protect all my confidential information. In fact, I'm writing this script on a Google Drive while in a cafe and connected to ExpressVPN. Ooh, how meta. So if you're getting out for some air these days, there's nothing to stop you from safely staying connected with ExpressVPN, whether it be for work or leisure, and with constant fast speeds, you'll never have to worry about keeping up with all that juicy content. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, phenomenal customer support, and an outstanding user-friendly interface to keep you right, find out how you can get three months free by visiting expressvpn.com slash Ryan. So originally, Saffron Burrow's character lead scientist Dr. Susan McAllister was set up to be the obligatory love interest who gets shipped with our charming hero Carter Blake, played by the then unknown Thomas Jean, for no real reason other than cinematic Hollywood idealistic tradition. However, in a 2013 interview, Harlan explained that this went down like a flaming turd with test audiences, who made it very vocally clear in their feedback cards that Susan was obviously the bad guy, prompting Harlan to reshoot the ending to make LL Cool J's character Preacher be the one who helps Carter kill the final shark, while Susan gets gruesomely eaten after sacrificing herself to bait the shark towards him. Most audiences and Harlan himself pretty much came to the same conclusion that Preacher was the real MVP, as he's the one innocuous disposable comic relief who ends up having tremendous depth and defying all expectations for his character. He was originally written to die early in the film, but Harlan was so impressed by Cool J's reading off the character that the entire role was reworked to take advantage of him. So what do I have to say to you? What mark do I have to leave behind? We will begin with the perfect omelet, which is made with two eggs, not three. Amateurs often add milk for density. This is a mistake. Now, without this information, Susan's death just looks like a ballsy, shocking twist that completely went against the romantic trope that dominated every Hollywood blockbuster. Part of this is because it's actually quite a tonally confusing moment, as it's not gratifying nor tragic. It's kind of in the middle, where it seems Susan didn't actually intend to die, but her escape route failed, so it's more awkward than anything else. But I do think it works as part of the film's overarching sense of irony that I'll come to later in the video. So 
you sure about that, Susan? It's a change that you really have to commend Harlan for addressing because I think most popcorn flicks would just ignore this when the action kicks in. I mean, it's technically more self-aware than most movies proclaiming self-awareness. Usually in these types of films, you get a bunch of banter merely to establish some glimmer of sympathy for the characters before unleashing carnage and basically asking the audience not to think too much about it because spectacle and explosions and some thirsty 90s raunchiness matter so much more apparently. Yet, Deep Blue Sea spends a lot more time on the character drama than you would expect, and there's a genuinely compelling moral conflict at the heart of it. We learn that the scientists are bound to an ethical code to ensure the safety and legitimacy of their work, but later on, Susan reveals that she secretly tampered with the shark's brain cells, causing them to enlarge and grow unnaturally intelligent in order to ensure the success of the experiment at the expense of violating that ethical code. And here's the thing, Susan is never redeemed or made to feel explicitly remorseful. She just doubles down on her actions throughout the entire film as necessary for the future of mankind. Although this does make her relatively sympathetic from the point of view that her work is meaningful and she does have good intentions at heart, but the only acknowledgement of responsibility comes from her sacrificing herself. If Carter ended up smooching her lips off instead, it would be both a contradiction of the characters and be so emotionally out of place. Carter openly rebukes Susan right from the very beginning. As one of the only non-scientists in the group, Carter is a shark wrangler who, like any of us, questions the very nature of treating these animals as toys to poke and prod without consideration for the fact that maybe the humans might be pissing them off. In fact, Susan very condescendingly underestimates Carter's abilities simply because he's not some book-educated intellect like herself. But it doesn't take someone with a big brain to work out that harmfully experimenting on the ocean's most infamous predators contained within the same old flimsy building as you and giving them an even bigger brain is probably not the best idea. It's also funny how Susan tries to play the moral high ground with Carter because he's apparently on probation for being a smuggler and she basically threatens to report him if he doesn't keep his head down and stop asking questions, hence why he was hired in the first place. She is literally controlling him through fear and you're telling me these two were originally supposed to reconcile their differences and hook up in the end? That's honestly the kind of twisted Hollywood bullshit I expect at this point. In a cynical way, I like to think of the whole situation as poetic irony as you have these self-absorbed scientists getting their efforts to play God literally thrown right back at them. Seriously, the sharks break in by lobbing one of them against the glass. What in God's creation? Oh, not his. Ours. Now, to be fair, not all the scientists are complete douchebags. It's actually just Susan and Stan Skarsgård's Jim who stand out as the douchiest, the latter of whom is the one that's battered against the glass. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't have stuck your hand near a fucking shark, you fucking... <clears throat> The other three have a lot more personality. Jan is so infectiously giddy about her work and is actually my favourite character for the heartbreaking and palpable sense of fear in her performance. Tom is just Michael Rapaport playing ball-busting Michael Rapaport. And Samuel L. Jackson, well, his role is definitely interesting to say the least. I honestly expected Sam Jackson's Russell Franklin to be the most likely human villain because he's the big cheese sent in to inspect progress for the company shareholders or something like that, but ends up being the most friendly and understanding character. It's vaguely brought up that he went through a life-changing experience after surviving a deadly avalanche and ever since, he's been incredibly passionate about saving lives, hence his enthusiasm for the science. According to Harlan, he's basically there to give the film some star par before being abruptly killed off in one of the most shocking character deaths in cinema history. Nobody, and I mean nobody, predicted his death this early in the film, even though it happens like an R into it. When the scene comes about, you get so absorbed by his charismatic speech that reflects on his personal survival against the avalanche, where the moral of the story is that nature might be lethal, but man will always be dominant only for that statement to be immediately proven wrong. 
Again, it further plays into these scientists underestimating nature and overestimating their own intelligence when Carter is the only one to show any true realistic understanding of nature. It is a fantastically timed jump scare because the framing of the camera to a close up just as Russell reaches the peak of his speech carries all the necessary build up for such a dramatically deflating payoff. While it's not a terrifying film by any means, I truly believe it's a much better crafted horror than many give it credit for. Like Snakes on a Plane, none of the deaths are fun, they're all genuinely violent, and I think the slow motion and stuttering effects add this overwhelming sense of shock rather than just because it looks cool. The only issue is that with the exception of Sam Jackson's death, all the other ones are predictably set up as the film transitions between isolated set pieces. For example, in the elevator scene, of course Jan is doomed when she falls in the water, and then later Carter and Tom have to activate a generator, and so obviously Tom is going to die, although granted, his death is in the trailer despite their efforts to hide it. They're still visually striking scenes, but the film doesn't do anything to surprise you after Russell's death sets a very high expectation for unpredictability, with maybe the only other surprise being that of Susan's demise. However, while Deep Blue Sea is a shark horror first and foremost, it also does a great job at making the ocean a tangible danger. When you think about it, it is technically the biggest threat facing the characters and perpetuates the true urgency of the story. Tom explains that this old bunker is not built to withstand such intense pressure, and as the flooding increases, so does the risk of the foundation compressing and collapsing. So the characters are forced into a situation where they have no choice, it's a damned if they do and damned if they don't scenario. They essentially end up with three options. They can wait and hope help arrives before the structure collapses, they could quickly swim to the surface if indeed there are sharks in the water, or what they end up doing is triggering the compression seal thus guaranteeing a way out through the building at the expense of time no longer being on their side. None of their decisions are based on irrational logic, they think everything through, and Carter especially comes up with some inventive plans like opening a door on the lower floor to reduce the speed of rising water as they climb the elevator shaft. The only irrational behaviour, like I said earlier, is arrogance, which leads to the whole situation to begin with. It's technically wrong to say the situation was caused by a shark attack, there are multiple factors at work here. Firstly, we have Susan, fucking Susan, messing with nature and making these sharks unnaturally smart and aggressive, then we have cocky Jim getting his arm bit off, which to be fair, he thought it was unconscious, this then leads to a rescue helicopter being destroyed by a storm, blocking an instant escape route and causing Jim to fall in the water, and thus allowing the shark to properly attack the facility, but only because Susan, fucking Susan, let her Frankenstein shark escape rather than let Carter euthanize it to prevent further problems. Now you can see where test audiences kinda took a bit of a dislike to Susan. She is largely to blame for things getting so out of control, her arrogant dismissal of ethics begins this domino effect, and it's believable because it only takes one self-absorbed control freak to ruin life for the rest of us. Without that data, everyone dying isn't just tragic. It's useless. Death is always useless, doctor. I mean, if you really want to dig into the ethics of it, the sharks are also victims in this because of genetic mutation and captivity. If anything, it's actually just the sharks seeking revenge on those responsible for experimenting on them, hence the line Russell says about the sharks very explicitly hunting the characters rather than just floating around the facility because now they can. Well, 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 am I the only asshole down here who thinks that a tad bit odd? There are movies I cover that I will concede are bad despite my efforts to make sense of them, but Deep Blue Sea isn't this daft B-movie many critics called it. It's smarter and more creative than it has any right to be, and you've gotta respect Harlan's willingness to try and make this something special. Regardless of whether it succeeded or not, every filmmaker wants to make a special movie, and Deep Blue Sea is unquestionably produced with passion. I know I jabbed the film for or wanting to be on the same pedestal as legendary horrors, but I can't say I wouldn't do the same. So make sure to let me know your thoughts on Deep Blue Sea in the comments below, and until next time, stay safe, don't genetically mutate sharks, and I'll see you all next time.